Thank you very much. So now we have to forget the sun and the nice weather outside because we are going back to the uh, Norwegian shelf, the Norwegian coastline, and we are going back to 1969. And it's a dark, uh, you know, uh, autumn day, uh, pretty bad weather, and we are going out to one of these drilling platforms uh, run by Philips. And uh, the atmosphere there is, uh, is not so fantastic because it's cold, and you know what? They are drilling the last drill, the last well, because they are just about to pull out of the Norwegian shelf. <coughs> now, uh, two in the morning, this guy called uh, Ståle Salvesen is told to wake up the platform chief. And he wakes him up and says, hey, you have to wake up. And the platform, platform chief says, gee, you really need a good reason to wake me up at two in the morning. And gee, did they have a good reason. They had just hit oil. Ecofisk, which at that time was the biggest oil field ever discovered in the world. Now, I have called this lecture Defining Moments. And of course, Norway finding oil was one of these type of moments. And looking back, there are a lot of defining moments in the history of the world. Some have led to wars and catastrophes, you know, other to great achievements and discoveries. Just think about the shots in Sarajevo, uh, with things like Neil Armstrong on the moon, Steve Jobs with the, with the iPhone, 9-11, and so on. But defining moments don't have to be, you know, important for the world history. They can also be just important for us in our lives, large or small, and a change of something, the end of something, the start of something else. Um, some defining moments can be planned for, but some can't be planned for. It can be the death, it can be the, the birth of a child, it could be your next job, it could be passing an exam. But how do you best prepare for these type of moments? And what are the character traits that help you best prepare for them? And for me, they are grit, they are patience, they are what you in Swedish call building, and then lastly, confident humility. Let me start with, uh, with grit. And uh, one defining moment in my life. I went um, to this thing called uh, Tolkskolan. You have it in Sweden, uh, we had it in Norway. It's basically, uh, uh, well, I at least thought it was very, very difficult. Uh, because you sit there and you try to learn Russian, and uh, I wasn't particularly good at it. And uh, I had really struggled for a very long time. And then I, I just kind of had it. You know, you get to a stage where life is so miserable that you don't know what to do. So I put on my, uh, my jacket, I went into the principal's I went towards the principal's office, you know, into these long military corridors, and I was just about to knock on the door and just kind of throw in the towel. <coughs> and I just couldn't get myself to knock that door. And that's probably the best thing I never did. <laughs> um, and I'm just so happy, you know, I didn't do it, because I just scraped through, you know, with my nails just hanging in there finished off as the second worst students, uh, but ended up with the, best <laughs> with the best friends of my life. Now, um, what, what did I learn from that? Now, we all, um, ha we all uh, love this idea of talent, you know? And uh, talent means that you have natural aptitude. But I don't really believe in talent. What I believe in is just, you know, kind of grit. Uh, and I, don't, I think nothing prepares you better for these moments than, than having grit. And grit, what is that? It's about follow through. It's about resilience and perseverance. It's about staying the course in the face of adversity, misfortune and hardship. And it's the powerful motivation to achieve something. In short, it's about just like taking it on the chin, not giving up and moving on. And it's really important for you young people there, uh, a lot of young people here, it's great, to remember that grit can compensate for not so great grades at school. 
And it's also important for those of us who are employers to understand that grit is more important than grades. Now I have a small experiment, if we can all raise up. All right. Suppose to live. No, it's this one. Oh, it's the humble one. Good. Are we on now? Now? We have our friend coming. Okay, so now we have sound. <laughs> Good. So now I'm going to count down four, three, two, one, and then I'm going to say jump. And then we're all going to just tiny little jump, okay? Four, three, two, one, jump. Great, great. Now you can sit down. <laughs> So, so what was that? Well, this week we launched a podcast in the oil fund. And I just did an interview with David Salomon, who is the chief executive of Goldman Sachs. And we are going to release that podcast next week. And I asked the chief executive of Goldman Sachs, what's the difference between young people now and before? And he said, Nikolai, when I was young, and people told me to jump, I just jumped. These days, you tell people to jump, and it's just like, jump? Me? Why? How high? How long? Is it, is it dangerous? Uh, can I jump tomorrow instead? Now, Nike has this uh, slogan, you know, just do it. And grit is kind of a bit linked to that. Sometimes, you just have to jump. Now, I also believe in patience and lifelong learning, and they are two very important ingredients in life. And the ability to learn throughout life has just never been better. Now, still I meet students who are really stressed about getting done with their education as soon as possible. And I just don't get that. What is that about? I mean, when you're young and you have your whole life ahead of you, you feel you're in a hurry. And when you're old like me, and you're about to die, you suddenly become really patient. That just doesn't make any sense. Because it's not at the age of 25 that you should measure your life, it's when you're 80. Maybe it has to do with the understanding of time. What is time? So my predecessor, Ingves Lyngstad, he went to a small little island up north in Norway with a lot of German philosophy books and he spent six months reading those books. I think that's pretty good. Now I kind of think what we all should be doing is to go to Bhutan, to some kind of mountain top, sit there with the monks, drink green tea for five years. I think that's the ultimate in education. Now the Swedish word building Building is hard to translate into English. Actually, there is not uh, an English equivalent. Now, I don't but they certainly have got a word for it. But it's basically what kind of knowledge and skills you need to obtain to become a good citizen. And I know that Lars, now we are getting into Lars territory here, because he talks about that. The more you know about the history of the world, the better you will be getting around, you know, the more interesting person you become. And that is one of my greatest advice to people, is just read really widely. Read not only what's on the curriculum, but just read classics, read history, and read fiction. And be more curious in life than, you know, the reading list that you get from your professors. Now, that also includes traveling as much as you can. You know, see new places, spend all your money. <laughs> now, you get a student loan when you are young, 
And I just think the worst thing you can do is to save any of that. Because the biggest and best investment you can make is travel and education and learning. Now, none of us present here today is a genius. And the sooner we realize that, the better it is. Because it's only when you discover that there are plenty of people who are much smarter than you are, that's when you really start to learn. Now, I spent a year at uh, the Norwegian School of Economics in Bergen, but then I, I uh, went to America. So I spent some years at Wharton. And there is one thing that they are really good at, at American universities. That's inflating your ego. That is really good. Now, I came out of Wharton, I thought I was God's gift. Okay, so after having worked six months at these companies in London, uh, my boss took me down and said, Nikolai, now it's uh, the day before Christmas holiday and uh, we need to have some feedback here. <clears throat> so he took me down. You know, next to the office, there was this staircase down to this wine cellar, like really dark. So we, as you do in England, you get a pint and then you get feedback. And uh, he had feedback long as a toilet roll, like a roll of toilet paper with all the negative things I had done. And not a single good thing had I done. Uh, so I went back during my Christmas holiday and just had the most terrible time of my life. Uh, awful. But then I came back and thought, you know what? I'm going to sharpen up here and show them. And that's what I did. Um, now, I don't think that's the ideal way of giving feedback, uh, but sometimes uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good. And I actually love this idea of feeling inferior. Because I think, when you realize that you know very little, that is a real driving force in your life. Now, the American social psychologist, Adam Grant, he talks about this concept called confident humility. And I think that's the perfect state of mind. Because you need to have trust and faith in yourself. You know, if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to believe in you. But at the same time, too much confidence in yourself is going to lead you in the wrong direction. So you need to know when you're wrong and act accordingly. Rarely are great results accomplished by one person in isolation. Now, even Nobel Prizes are now won by teams. And when people come together, they need to be organized. Now, one of these types of organization is called bureaucracy. Now, there is nothing wrong with bureaucracy in su as such, and I belong to one. But the bureaucratic model of organizing people, on the other hand, it's not my favorite. In the book Humanocracy by Gary L. Hamill, they point to bureaucracy and say that we should not resign ourselves to organizations that are less capable than the people in them. That is what bureaucratic organizational models do. They make humans less than they actually are, and that's why I don't like them. And to solve this problem, the first thing we need to do is so-called silo busting. Now, a silo is something that divides one thing from the other. It creates walls and fences within an organization. They may look good on paper, but they hamper an organization severely. Now, in the oil fund, we know this, and we are working really hard to tear them down by putting together people from very diverse teams. We have made something called the investment simulator in the oil fund. Now, what is that? An investment simulator is taking all the knowledge we have uh, from trading systems, from the kind of things that people have been doing uh, in the history, and we are putting them together into a, a feedback system. So, for instance, if Lars comes to me and he says, Nikolai, when he tries to put in an order, I'm going to buy some Apple shares. The, the system will basically tell, tell Lars that, you know, you have never made money in Apple. You have not even made money in America. We are now in November and you have lost money so far this year. And historically, when you have put on risks 
at this time of the, of the year, after so much losses, that has been really bad for you. You know, the stock is really loved by all the investors, and that has not been a good thing for you. So you get all these kind of things fed back into this system, into this uh, learning system, which is uh, really, really good. And here we have created this system where high-tech experts, portfolio managers, and traders all work together. We have basically busted the silos. Another important dimension in getting people to work together is, of course, to put the right people together. Now, we call that diversity. Now, in the oil fund, we have traditionally had people studying economics, but increasingly, we hire people with all kinds of different backgrounds. We now have political scientists working with communication specialists. We've got philosophers in corporate governance. We have a, a doctor as a portfolio manager. And we have a sports psychologist, which you have also here at the, School of the Stockholm School of Economics, working with everyone. We also have people without any formal education, in particular in cyberspace. We have a guy with no formal education whatsoever, and he is really one of my heroes. And an organization needs people with all kinds of different backgrounds. It's when they start to disagree that we get proper friction, and that just creates better solutions and new insights. And it makes us better prepared to act on these defining moments. Now let me ask you, um, when you hire people to your company, who, who do you hire? Do you hire people who are completely different from yourself, or you hire people who are the same? Now if you look at the CEOs of, of Norwegian companies, they all went to the same school, they read the same books, they pretty much are uh, friends, and I suspect it's pretty much the same here in Sweden, if not even worse. Um, and most people have studied business. A lot of the companies we have are knowledge-based companies, you know, which kind of depend on, on people and so on. Now, how many people, how many leaders of the top 50 companies in Norway have come from the HR department? Three, three out of the top 50. I suspect it's the same in this country. It's just much easier to hire people who did the same as you did because there is less risk involved. Nobody gets fired. Now, I don't really believe in that. I believe that diversity should be really part of an organization's DNA. And you can't really delegate that to the HR department. Now, a trend we are seeing now in recruitment and so on is that we have you know, chief diversity officer, director of diversity. Head of diversity, now FBI has got one of those, Harvard Business School has got one of those. And as you can see from LinkedIn, these type of titles have just exploded over the last few years. But the thing is that diversity can't be delegated. It's not somebody's responsibility. It goes for everybody. And it needs to be implicit in everything we do. So it's like love, it can't be delegated. That's just how important it is. Okay. Behind a lot of these defining moments in life, there have been strong leaders. At least that's what the history books tell us. In a perfect world, you don't need leaders, because people lead themselves. Well, the world is just not perfect. And what does it take from leaders to get the best out of people? Well, first of all, stay out of the way as much as you can. Know when you are needed. Because the people who work uh, for you and with you, they know the stuff better than you do. Your job as a leader is to make the environment as good as possible for these people to perform, to stay motivated and inspired. And in order to do that, you must communicate, communicate, communicate all the time and ask for feedback. Now, in the oil fund, we do this all the time. We try to communicate as much as we can. And what is the most read thing on our intranet? That's the notes from the leader group meetings. So we share everything, well, not exactly everything, but we share as much as we can from the leader group meetings. That means that the people in the organization know in which direction we are going, and they know what is probably coming within a few months. 
Then we use LinkedIn quite a lot. How many here follow me on LinkedIn? Yeah, and what's uh, wrong with the rest of you? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, now we have also, uh, as I mentioned, started a podcast. Now, what is this podcast thing? You know, stuff, oil fund. Why? Why do you have a? Why do you have a pod podcast? Well, the oil fund owns all these great companies on behalf of the Norwegian population. All Norwegians have a stake in this great fund. And so for me, it's important that they know what they own, right? At the same time, because we are a large shareholder, we have access to these incredible leaders and get to interview them. And that's what we're trying to explore in this podcast series. And there is advice there for students, for business leaders, and just for the general public. And that's why we have launched it. And I think it's just really cool. Last week, we had uh, BP. Uh, next week, we have Goldman Sachs. The following week, uh, General Motors, Mary Barra, who is probably the most powerful business lady in the world. So tune in to that one. We mentioned communication, but feedback as well is very, very important. When I started in the oil fund, I had 140. 140 uh, conversations with people there. You know, I sat down and had, and just learned a lot. Now, why is that important? Well, because the more you, more information you have, the better data points you have, the better uh, decisions you make. Everybody have been involved, so it's easier to get them to change direction and so on. But I had one which really stands out. We have people who run uh, bond portfolios in the fund. And what do they do? Well, what they do is basically listen to press conferences with central bankers. Now, I had, I had a, conference, a press conference a couple of weeks prior to this, which was, I thought, a bit mixed. <coughs> and what this guy called Oscar said is just like, Nikola, you are, we don't know each other, but you, know, you say that you want feedback and so on, so may I just give you a tiny bit of feedback here? Yeah, sure. Nikolai, that conference, you know, that press conference, you were just crap, you know. You just stank. And I thought, oh, great, you know, thanks, good feedback. Uh, at, least, at least it's pretty clear. Um, so what did we do after that? Well, next time I prepared for a press conference, I had one of the bond traders helping me. You know, nobody knows press conferences better than him. So to pull together that kind of expertise, who would normally not be involved, is really, really key. Now, communication feedback and credit contribute to what we call intrinsic motivation. You know, you've got two types of motivation. You have extrinsic motivation, which is about salary and all that unimportant thing. Then you have intrinsic motivation, which is the important stuff. That's the kind of thing that helps you through adversity and helps you to survive a bad boss. I believe that you, there is no limit for what you can achieve if you don't care who gets the credit. So be very generous with the credit. That makes people around you grow and achieve better things. Okay, now let's do try to connect the dots here at the end. Can you think of a defining moment um, in your life? Now, I've shared some of uh, mine today. Uh, some of them we are prepared for, some of them we aren't. I believe that the personal features, grit, resilience, building and confidence, humility are really, really important and I also think it is very, very important how we organize ourselves. So we should organize ourselves in so-called humanocracies and not in bureaucracies. Diversity is completely key. And I believe in communication, feedback and credit, to give credit to other people in order to make them grow. So let's take a few seconds and think about um, some of the defining moments in your life. It could be anything, major event in history, a moment that has affected you particularly strongly. 24th of February this year was another defining moment. Russia invaded Ukraine. The world as we knew it was just turned upside down. 
We are witnessing something we never thought we would witness, a fully-fledged war on European soil. Now, I've often been asked, what is the biggest threat and challenges to the Norwegian oil fund? And I normally say, well, you know what? It's geopolitics and inflation. But little did I think that we would see this war. And so we have to completely rethink. Now, we last week had a leader group get together in the oil fund with over 150 leaders. And I asked them to think about what this uh, uncertainty uh, do to all of us. And I asked them to care for the people they are leading. And I mean really, really care to connect with their colleagues at a deeper level than we have done before. Because in these type of times, that's more important than ever before. We just need more glue between people in the organization. And we just need more love. So maybe I need to add another feature to what I believe is the most important thing in helping us prepare for these defining moments. And that's the ability to care, to really, really care deep down. Thank you.